I've been reading your book, This Timeless Moment, with extraordinary fascination. I don't think I've ever read a biography quite like that, because it's not a complete biography. It's the story of the last days, in a way, or the last years of Aldous Huxley. But I can't think of anybody else who has been written about by his widow and uh, a case where the book was so very largely concerned with the process of death and with a highly intelligent form of dying. There, there, uh, there is, as I remember, a story which is supposed to have been told of Goethe that when he was dying, somebody called, wanted to see him, but the maid answering the door said, but the master is busy dying. And uh, our culture is one in which death is invariably something swept under the carpet. Yes. We pretend it doesn't really happen. Yes. And uh, therefore there is no realization that dying is an art. And it's an adventure, too, you know. It's maybe, I don't know, but maybe it's the only chance that we have that one. We don't know. It is, and I think uh, as you tell the story, you acted as a marvelous high priestess in helping someone through this adventure. Well, uh, Aldous had done the same thing for his first wife, Maria, you see, and that, of course, gave me the inspiration. And he spoke uh, very often of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, mm -hmm. which I haven't uh, read completely, but I mean, I know the basic assumption. And, uh, I mean, throughout, uh, throughout his work, uh, he spoke about this fact of paying attention. You remember in Ireland... Where, where the minor birds yes. call out, here and now, boys, you, attention! You know, I love so much uh, your, your seminar, your tapes on, on that book. It's the best uh, presentation of that book that I could hope to, to hear. Yes, I think that was a very great book, Ireland. The problem is that I found in giving lectures, if I announce a title for a lecture and then give a lecture on a different subject, even though it may be a perfectly good lecture, people are somehow discombobulated. I think you somehow. always give a lecture well, on a different no, subject, Alan. No, you I, always do that. I, I, I can talk that. about the same thing in ever so many different ways. But the point is, uh, when Aldous put out Island, uh, he put it out in the form of a novel. That's right. And people have very fixed ideas of what a novel is supposed to be. And they had identified Aldous to a great extent as a novelist. And then when it so turned out that Ireland was a sociological textbook almost, a, a sociological blueprint in the form of a novel, uh, they said, well, he's really sermonizing with a few entertaining bits added. Uh, just because of the novel form. Yes, I mean, it would have really, uh, I think, been better if he would have written it uh, straight as a manual for living and loving and dying. Because uh, then it would, uh, uh, the public would not have, have expected a novel, which apparently, as a novel, it's not this very best. No. And no, but that's, uh, that's ridiculous. Uh, the, the, it's quite obvious to anyone who reads it that it wasn't a really intended to be a novel. Well, it's quite it obvious just put to in you, Alan. Yes. No, it's different, you know. And in, I mean, in conclusion, very few people have read it. And there are so many sequences, there are so many methods which are so practical for here and now. It would be wonderful if we could apply only a few of them. We would all feel better. You know, I have really sort of a crusade against useless suffering. And in that book, there is so much about suffering which is not necessary, it's not creative, it's just uh, just nothing. It doesn't bring any enlightenment, any compassion. A great it's number of young people are reading this book today. Good, yes. And uh, it has become a sort of inspiration for many of them for experiments in forming new kinds of family. New communities, intentional communities. But I heard a story where Aldous was challenged about this book and said, now, did you uh, mean this seriously? And he said, oh, no, it is purely an intellectual exercise. Did he say that? Well, he's supposed to have said that. But what do you think about that? You were with him while he was Well, writing. I think exactly the contrary. I don't think it was an intellectual exercise. I mean, he might have said that uh, as a joke, yes. but he really 
every sequence in that book, every method, every recipe, if you like to call it that way, um, is something that uh, most of them, at least, he uh, experimented himself in his own life. And uh, he, uh, don't know, it was not an intellectual exercise. The part of the novel, the, the writing the novel, it was probably an intellectual exercise because he had to fit it. Now, I realize that. Yes, but... Um, uh, all this also once said, when you are with savages, don't fool them with them because you will end up in the cooking pot. <laughs> and therefore, he used to know how to be very perspicacious and tactful about his public relations. But you know, a thing that has often occurred to me is that Aldous Huxley was one of the most highly educated men I ever ran into. Mm. When you study the field of his interests, the scope of his interests, especially as revealed in his essays, in, uh, he knew a great deal about the history of art, oh, yeah. an enormous amount about the history of science and technology. He was fond of the theater. He, uh, he knew about music. He, he had an encyclopedic mind, and he carried all this with a lovely urbanity, so much so that I think a great many people simply didn't know how to understand him because they weren't well-educated enough. That's right. The frame of reference was enormous. But, uh, for instance, I can tell you about music. I am a violinist. I've been trained as a violinist. has been the major work in my life. And one time he mentioned a concerto, a Viotti concerto, that no one knows except the violinist who had to study, you know, to, to, to work the technique and so on. And he knew this Viotti concerto. It was absolutely extraordinary. He, he, had, uh, he knew as much as specialists, really, in their field. And then, of course, he could uh, correlate all of this. And in this utopia, in this island, he wanted to put everything in, you know, all the chemical study, all the progress in pharmacology, and make it into a concrete mysticism. Well, I think he, uh, along with that, you see, had the difficulty of living in a country where that sort of highly cultured intellectuality is envied, and because it's envied, it's put down. People used to circulate stories, for example, that before going to a party, Aldous would read in the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, <laughs> such, everything that he'd had to say on the letter P, oh, no, the so origins well. of that. And then he would subtly move the conversation around to where the letter P in some way became important. And then would proceed to be completely <laughs> encyclopedic upon the subject. You know, they told me before going to a party, all this only discussed what I was going to wear and how he liked it and this and that. <laughs> well, I think that sort of story expresses the envy and the resentment which people feel for such high culture. Well, I don't think he was aware of that, really. He was no. very amused. I never saw in all that I knew of him any kind of um, awkward self-consciousness about these things. He had a kind of reserve which is very natural to Englishmen of his upbringing. Uh, a lot of people, for example, uh, I had a rather similar upbringing, and a lot of people think that I'm a bit isolated and difficult to reach, when it isn't that at all. It's really consideration for other people, uh, fundamentally, which yes, makes English yes. people reserved. Uh, we don't want to, you know, throw ourselves at everyone. <laughs> And so it's very difficult to transplant yourself to the United States where that's more or less what you're expected to yes, do. Yes, and yet uh, with the bringing, you know, he, he would live very much in the American way and enjoy it. You know, we, uh, I said in the book, we were married in a drive-in chapel. Well, now, less English than that and less Italian than that, you can find it. And he enjoyed it, and I enjoyed it very much. And he did all the things that were done in America, you know. He didn't try to transplant this on way of living here. Yes, but of course there is still a fundamental style of life. Oh, a style of life, an inner style, that yes. That's an inner style, style, exactly. Oh, yes, very much so. But I mean, he would, if I was not there for lunch or something, he would make his own lunch very well. And this is rather You mean he American. was a good cook? Oh, yes, he was a very nice cook. He particularly liked to make soups. We had a whole, he once even thought of writing a little book about making soups. Well, I never... <laughs> your own book going on? <laughs> oh, I, I tell you, I have abandoned that for the time being because I felt that writing about gourmet cookery at this moment would be like fiddling while Rome burns. Well, uh, so what are you doing by Rome, about Rome? I'm writing a book instead about ethics called The Rules of the Game. Uh -huh. 
And I think that's an extremely important subject yes. for young people. Oh, yes. And uh, as you see, in the same way, um, you could say from a certain point of view that as his life went on, all of Aldous's books became more serious, or I would prefer to say sincere, and concerned with profound matters. And this is what you're doing. But you know, there's a... a, a the critics have tended to say about the later work of Aldous Huxley, which begins with a book called Ends and Means. I remember reading an article by Charles Savage in the Sewanee Review some years ago, uh, discussing the change in his work, and saying that we are really seeing two different sides of the same man. He pointed out that Aldous is at his best when he is destroying, when he is satirizing, when he is poking fun mm -hmm. and contempt at various things. And so in all his early satirical novels, he proved himself to be a master of this. Now, said Savage, he shifts to a certain kind of mysticism. But the message of this mysticism is really the same as that of his earlier novels. Namely, that the, 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 the human world, the world of personalities, the world of differentiation, the world of multiplicity, of nature, is really fundamentally contemptible and should all be dissolved in the undifferentiated <laughs> aesthetic continuum, <laughs> so in the Brahman, in the Ungrund, in <laughs> the uh, just, uh, what uh, have you, you know? Oh, goodness, interpreting is a terrible thing. It should be one of the great crimes. Isn't it? So, because I was astounded. Really, I mean, I how can it? one come to such a conclusion after... All that he tries well, in every see, paragraph, you know, to say the, the, the importance of each person, of each uh, thing in nature, even of things as such. But he saw that. And, but, but these people can't see that he saw it. You see, I had met Aldous just about the time, just a little before I read that review, and that mm -hmm. was back in, uh, oh, 1947. And he had then written Grey Eminence, and the perennial philosophy. Mm -hmm. And in Grey Eminence, I feel that at that time, Aldous was somewhat under the influence of Gerald Hurd's more ascetic period. Possibly, yes. That was when Gerald Hurd was running the co-educational monastery yes, at Tribuco. That's right, that's right. And they were trying to they take the kingdom of heaven by <laughs> storm. Yes. And they were all very much, uh, in a way, mystically uptight. And I felt a little reflection of that of in Aldous at the time. Maybe, yes. But then... Uh, when uh, he, his attitude began to change, he became less and less uh, the Manichaean yes. and more and more uh, a, what I would call a tantric type. Yes, concrete and type. You wrote me a wonderful letter when he died about that, how you have felt this development uh, in Aldous, especially in the later years, in all his way of being, even of dressing. I mean, you, the, the outer signs, of course, uh, there can be many. Well, to tell you the truth, Laura, when I first met him, it was in Hollywood, and he came out in the most decrepit old pants and a run-down <laughs> shirt, and, of course, he was vastly entertaining, but he was looking pretty, pretty shabby. And I met him again after he married you. And suddenly, he was <laughs> nattily dressed. He was wearing a beautiful tweed jacket <laughs> with a handkerchief in the breast pocket just so. He was beautifully groomed, and I thought, my goodness, oh, he had uh, a wonderful, <laughs> changed. <laughs> he had a wonderful collection of ties, you know. I must send you one, but you don't wear ties because it was a most magnificent collection, and they would be called psychedelic ties. Well, you know, I wear ties when the occasion requires. Oh, I, I you must you remember, <laughs> I, I'm a sort of joker or comedian oh, I know, who adopts know, the guy who's suitable just, to the occasion. Uh, I know. <laughs> But, um, no, I always had the impression, you see, that, that this criticism of savages was absolutely ridiculous because uh, I never met a man who had so many interests. In other words, he was profoundly interested in all the diversities. Yes, and he was so so curious, and in everything, really, time, timeless moment. I mean, it's true, he was living moment by moment. And uh, it, uh, he had, I suppose, disciplined himself to that, or maybe... He, that was why he enjoyed life so much. Yes. That was, uh, he was, uh, another thing, I mean, people think sometimes that he was a depressed man. He was hardly ever a depressed man. 
very, very seldom. He was preoccupied, but they always tried to do something about this preoccupation, you know, the state of the world and all that. But I think all uh, writers tend to get moods of preoccupation. You get completely fascinated with writing, and then you may suddenly have to have a meal, and you'll turn up and sit down and eat, and you can't get off your mind off the various ideas yes, or right. themes you're playing with, and your wife may say to you, what's the matter with you? Uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> can't you make any conversation? Are you angry with me? <laughs> or something no. of that kind. No, no, no. That uh, really only happened with all this, uh, when he was right in Ireland, because of this contest, you know, of the novel and the essay. Otherwise, his writing, uh, yes, it fascinated him, but he was very ready to to change, you know, to change the course of his thought. But with Ireland, two or three times uh, he was like that. And then, of course, when he was ill at the end, because there were so many things still that he wanted to do. And he wondered, you know, how much, how long would he, uh, what, uh, how long a time would he have, how much energy. There was a period there like that. Uh, and, yes. It took a long time to write Ireland, didn't it? Yes, he wrote it in two or three periods. He left it sometimes and then went back again. Of course, that's the hardest thing to do. Uh, in a way, it's easy to write Brave New World because there uh, the point of view is, in a way, critical. But in Ireland, where you want to paint the vision of what you really believe in and what you would like to happen, that's the hardest thing to do. Yes, and then, uh, as you said, that, that, who is it that said that uh, the, the mauvais, uh, really, the bad sentiment make good novels? Yes. Bad sentiments make good, no yes. good novels. Yes. yes. Because when everything is fine and nice and everybody's good and happy, it's very difficult <laughs> to write about it. Yes, and in the same way, I think that the... The imagery of paradise in the history of Western art has been artistically inferior to the imagery of hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you take, for example, Gustave Doré's illustrations to the Divina Commedia, yeah. those for hell and purgatory are fascinating. Yeah. But the illustrations for the Paradiso are yeah, just these really streams of angels in white nighties flying around the sky, and they're very uninspiring. <laughs> well, because that's right, but then... Uh, uh, he should have seen that in different ways, you see. We, now there is all kind of different illustration because uh, the photography, for instance, photography, there is in your book, uh, the joyous... Ex the joyous cos cosmology. The cosmology. And the photography of flowers or things of nature, it, it is so magnificent. But I think that maybe this is changed now, don't you think? Yes, I think so. I think uh, okay. we are seeing the re-emergence yes. in Western art of sheer glory. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, which we haven't seen since the stained glass and the illuminated Wind manuscripts of the yes, Middle Ages. and it is the same thing. It's the mythical experience which right. brings this expression about. I think that the best illustrations of paradise are to be found in Persian miniatures. Ah, yes. <laughs> was Aldous interested in those? Yes, uh, yeah, we had, well, we had some books. Yes, he was always looking at, with the enlarging glass, you know, to look yeah. at the details of the now, I must, to some extent, attribute the change in his attitude and also in Gerald Hurd's attitude to the time when they first encountered LSD. Um, it seemed to me that in, in both of them, uh, there was a, a marked shift of attitude. I suppose that those who would be unfavorable to all this would say, well, that's the time they got their brains damaged. Mm -hmm. But it was highly interesting damage uh, <laughs> for both of them because uh, I, I felt that the attitudes of both of them became somehow enriched. Oh, yes. Well, of course, I knew Aldous very little before that. In fact, I only met him uh, a few times. But... Uh, uh, when I saw him after that experience, which was in Rome, uh, it, it was this tremendous vitality and this tremendous interest in looking and seeing and experimenting. Of course, he didn't do this experimenting uh, so often as people thought, you know. It was done very, very rarely. And very oh, strange. well, that's, what, that's the way I think in any intelligent use of this kind of thing. Yes. A single experience gives you so much that it takes several months to digest it. Yes, exactly. And, you know, to go on week after week or oh, worse, goodness. day after day with this sort of thing is to give yourself a mystical indigestion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and all this had not happened, you see, by the time that Aldous died. It was just beginning in 1963. I remember in the last 
few months or even weeks of his life, he began to hear about abuses and so on. I think he would be horrified to see what... I wonder what he had, would have done, you know, to prevent this, of course. He would have done all that he could. And I wonder how much he could have accomplished in preventing this misuse and abuse. And well, the sensation, there is so much sensation about All that this. kind of thing seems to me to be inevitable, inevitable. in a world where there are no secrets. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, exactly. scientific knowledge has to be public knowledge because uh, the community of scientists has to know all about it in order to work. And therefore, there are no secrets, and therefore everything gets broadcast around. And uh, I felt that when Aldous had let the cat out of the bag with the doors of perception, and later with heaven and hell, that I ought to write something about it too. Mm -hmm. I was reserved about writing anything about it much mm -hmm. before, but I felt that he had let the cat out of the bag and that uh, more needed to be said. Uh, now, of course, the cat would have been let out of the bag eventually. There's no doubt about it. Well, I think so, and probably not as well in such a good manner. No, right. Think, I mean... But now, when was it uh, approximately that he first experimented with In 1953. LSD? In 1953. 53, that's right. And uh, the of perception came out uh, then in 54, that's right. As early as 54? Oh, yes. Those of perception is at 50, uh, 1950. Oh, I had no idea it was that early. Wait a second. I was going to Italy, and I read it on the plane. No, it came out in 1955. 55? Yes, that might be. No, 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 54. 54, 54 still. It was in the summer of 54 that I read it. Because, you see, I didn't run into this until 1958. Oh, I think that we, uh, we met here in San Francisco one time, yes. Yes, that's right, at the, yes. the, the Tokyo Skiaki yes, restaurant. Yes, yes, that's yes. right. But I hadn't uh, encountered it until that time. You got married in what year? In 1956. 1956? Uh-huh. Well, anyway, um, I felt that this had uh, fully opened his eyes to see that the mystical world, uh, or the mystical dimension of unity uh, behind the whole cosmos was no longer something that required for its vision a turning away from the diversity of the material world but you could see this unity this underlying unity right in the de in the multiplicity of the yes. material world yes, and uh, he, he seemed to be feeling that more and more strongly yes, as yes, time went yes, on yes, yes, yes. I remember uh, he was uh, writing to me that summer uh, uh, summer before we were married he was in New York and he wrote to me that he went to see a musical comedy, and it was a very poor and vulgar thing. And he said, yet, even there, if one would look with attention and look deeply, one could find some kind of a, uh, essence of beauty. Or well, I had exactly the same experience in listening to a terrible Baptist preacher <laughs> on the radio. Well, that's the same thing. Though. And uh, it was really awful. Yes. And it was as phony as it could be. Yes. And it was concerned with money. Send in your dollar. You know, yes, if you yes, want to copy yes, this yes. address, be sure to send in your dollar. But as I listened deeply into that voice, it sounded like someone saying, well, I'm just alive and i got to eat too. <laughs> and it was a little baby calling for its mother in the dark. Uh -huh. yes, yes. And, but it was coming on like, you know, all this uh -huh. God and Jesus and salvation and everything. And... Uh, saying it uh, as if it knew all about it, but you could see this was a big front on quaking terror underneath. Yes. Yes. Well, the same thing, you see, there was nothing that... Uh, Aldous really was a very fine musician, and musical comedy for him was not his type of music. And particularly this one, I don't know which one it was, but it was particularly bad. And yet, and yet, you know, if you listen, he said, he would find something in that. Did he ever discuss these experiences with Krishnamurti? He did. Uh, he told me that uh, the very first time that he had it, uh, with Maria and Dr. Osman, you remember, mm -hmm. and then he went up to Ohio and uh, spoke about it to Krishnaji. And uh, Krishnaji was very familiar with the whole thing. He said, oh, yes, yes. He said, oh, yes, that's right, that's so, that's so. He, was, uh, he knew exactly what 
Aldous was speaking about. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that Krishnaji is there all the time, except when he has to come back and talk a little bit, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the merit of uh, Krishnamurti to, to do this uh, speaking to people, because probably he would have a much better time not to. Would, would you say that Aldous was greatly influenced by Krishnaji? Yes, I would, I would say uh, that he was influenced by Krishnaji, probably more than by any other single religious man. Well, I, uh, in a way, could say the same thing. Only uh, one is always very hesitant in acknowledging any debt to Krishnaji because he so hates the idea of having any disciples. <laughs> yes. yes. But I, for my part, feel that he is uh, one of the most original and profound thinkers in the world. Because uh, he's always in a bit, in, uh, a bit unexpected. He's never in the ordinary ruts yeah. of uh, a religious or psychotherapeutic thinking. Well, the trouble is that he, uh, I mean, the trouble is not the trouble. It's the, point, the point is that uh, that is what he is. But uh, he does not give any way to get there. And that is the great thing, you see. People say, well, why, how am I going to do that? And you know that he really was... Uh, very, very angry at me when I wrote uh, that book, you know, You Are Not the Target with uh, Recipes of Techniques. I yes. thought that I was very innocent and I told him about it with great pleasure. And, um, oh, he was quite violent about it. Oh, you tell that story in your book, yes, really, don't you? Very, yes, and, um, yes, because uh, I, was, I spoke about this uh, during a lunch and then we were alone and he looked at me very, very intensely. And he said, you know, all these people that go around helping other people, I think they are a curse <laughs> looking at me. <laughs> I was so shaken, but after a few seconds, I, I found myself and I said, well, what do you think you are doing? And his answer was so delightful. He said, oh, but I don't do it on purpose. And that was something that all was just adored, this thing. I don't do it on purpose, you know. It was so, so clear to all this what he meant. But it's not clear to everyone because it's not easy, really. That was the conversation, wasn't it, that, uh, again, it's reported in your book, where he ends up on this extraordinary note that the state of consciousness that he is trying to describe as in himself is one which has no center. No center, that's right. And it is just the opposite of what we find. You know, we always try to find the central core of ourselves. Yes. And uh, go to the center, find it, be the center. And he said, no center. Yes, that was very strange. Very strange. One can feel uh, that for him it's all so natural, for Krishnamurti all this is so natural, so obvious, that it seems to him preposterous even to have to say these things. But I must say it's not uh, natural and easy for many people that I know. It's not easy for me, so that... Did Krishnaji in any way disapprove of Aldous's use of psychedelics to see these things? Well, uh, this I don't know. He never told me that, and I don't think that he ever said anything like that to Aldous. Uh, no, I think uh, the two men were so nice together. I don't know. They, they, they didn't speak much. You know, we once uh, visited Krishnaji in India for three days, and I don't think that they ever talked very much about all this deep uh, philosophies or modes of existence. They just were very nice together. One felt a tremendous liking for each other. It was a very special atmosphere when they were together. But I don't know that he, criticized, that he told him, you know, directly you shouldn't do this or anything like that. In other words, when they got together, uh, they didn't discuss deep matters, but no. just enjoyed themselves. <laughs> it's a matter of fact, I must tell you about those three days because we were living in the house of this great mystic, and uh, he had a marvelous cook. And we always looked forward to the next meal. It was the most refined food that you could imagine without any animal uh, food, you know, completely vegetarian. And the variety of tastes 
and the delicacy, I mean, the great refinement, really, of the way that uh, Krishnaji lives. He's, uh, in a way, he could have been, he, maybe he is an hedonist, you see, because he appreciates all the things of perception. We say hedonist. Hedonist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I remember him once speaking about materials. And everything, his perception are so cleansed, you know, the doors of his perception are very, very clear. And it was marvelous, I was waiting for the next meal. You, you know, see, this, of speaking. this is fascinating because this doesn't come out in Krishnamurti's lectures. No, I know, I know. Uh, Nor does humor come out. No, and he has a great deal of humor, although he's very, very preoccupied about the world. He was, I haven't seen him lately. He was preoccupied about the world because they, in the world there's so many churches and priests and psychologists and all that. That was, which uh, probably he equates in a way with politicians and all the rest of it, you know. People that uh, are uh, being followed, that are followers. He has that, but do you think that... that uh, one can be without leaders, do you really think so? Well, I suppose you could argue that the presence of churches and priests and psychologists were like the presence of spots on a person who has chicken pox. <laughs> uh, of course, these spots are, in a way, letting off yeah. infections inside yeah. the body, yeah. and therefore they fulfill some sort it's of function. Is. But uh, they go with a diseased condition. After all, if we were living uh, in harmony with the, the the way of nature, the Tao, as the Chinese call it, yes. we wouldn't need churches and priests and psychotherapists. I know, but we don't <laughs> live in the Tao. No. Yes. And but uh, but perhaps. Um, well, I think you know. Uh, this is a bit off the subject, but uh, when you get into a real jam, and you realize it's useless to call the psychiatrist, you're undergoing a very creative experience. Yes, if you if you go to the all the way to the end of it, yeah, if you stop yeah. it in the middle, and you don't call the psychiatrist, no, 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 you see, no, 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 no. I have a, a kind of terror of calling a psychiatrist oh, well, into any situation because I know what it might lead to, yes. and so I always try to leave it alone, and uh, I don't want to offend my psychiatric friends by saying this, but uh, uh, I mean some of them know how to handle things, and some of them I just was just talking to one the other day who wouldn't dream of getting one of his patients into a mental hospital. And, uh, he would not dream. No, he wouldn't dream of it. He does everything in his power well, to avoid yes, that sort yes, of a solution yes, or non-solution. Yes. But I, I think, in a way, uh, this is uh, Krishnaji's attitude to all the people who are trying to help others, is that uh, a lot of people are doing that kind of work to try and help other people. But uh, I know in my own case, uh, I'm not really trying to help the world. And I think that's what Krishnaji is saying when he doesn't do this on purpose. When he says he doesn't do it on purpose. Uh, and I think that uh, Aldous had a very similar attitude, that he was writing about mysticism and uh, philosophy and religion, not because he was... or He was even writing about the alarming state of the world. But you never felt in him the fanatic. No. He was so extraordinarily interested in what was going on that that seems to me the primary reason why he wrote. Oh, yes. Well, that is, was his, his life, was his way of living, yes. to write, you know. But I asked all this, uh, when, uh, when Krishnaji told me that, you know, and so violently, I said, what, uh, what do you think? Uh, should I do this? And he said, no, everything should be done. What Krishnaji does is... Uh, Marvelous, but uh, what you do, uh, giving tools and giving recipes, that is also necessary. I mean, he included everything. He yes. didn't think that, uh, you know, only one thing, that it was only one panacea. That is, of course, was completely different from his way of being. He couldn't have been uh, so restricted. But why did you, what did you say just a minute ago about yourself? That you... Well, I often say half-chokingly, when I'm asked in a student audience, why do you go around lecturing on these things? I say, because I'm a philosophical entertainer. <laughs> uh, after all, when you... Not all entertainment is frivolous. You do pay entertainment tax when you go to a concert. 
by a pianist who's going to play Mozart sure. and Beethoven sonatas. You could hardly call that frivolous. And so there can be philosophical entertainment in the same spirit. Yes. And then also, I mean, everybody has to express himself uh, the best way. And it seems to me you are such a marvelous virtuoso of words, like all this was. Naturally, you must use your virtuosity. It would be bad for you and for everybody else if you wouldn't. Now, here, here's the thing that's fascinating. You see, I, in, in using words, I've been accused of being a word man. Well, of course you, know? you would, I mean, but I mean, that is, uh, <laughs> that's beside the point. You can be accused of everything. Well, of course you can. <laughs> but you know, people, in, in, especially when you get into the, this whole new domain of emphasis upon the experiential. Oh, yes. Not ideas, not theories, mm -hmm. but getting down to the nitty-gritty, the real experience. And so this is true with the encounter groups, oh, with the tea yes. groups, oh, with yes, the, oh, yes. you know, all that kind of thing. And uh, I remember once Fritz Perl saying to me, he said, uh, the trouble with you is you're all words. Well, it's you're a <laughs> dancer, you, you dance around with words. And I said, now listen, Fritz, don't you put down words. No. Words are a pattern of life, just like a fern, just like a snow crystal, just like a cloud. Sorry. And if I play with that kind of a pattern, am I any really less experiential than the fern that plays with the chlorophyll and uh, such things to you become a fern? It's marvelous when you think of words. If you just take any one word, uh, not just thinking about how it came about in the expression, but just what your mouth does to, to pronounce that word is the most fascinating thing. That you oh, can. yes, I love to write nonsense, you know, yes. where the words don't have any meaning. Yes, but they, they are just the right. But the it's movement. just... Um, I went to get the bucket of ducks, bucket of ducks, bucket of ducks. I went to get the bucket of ducks all on a summer's day. Calluckety bucket, lickety bucket, <laughs> snippety snappity snickety bucket, floppity flippity flippity bucket, all in the same old way. You know, things like Wonderful. that. Wonderful. You now, see, what, what your tongue and your mouth and your lips have to do to that is a miracle, yeah. you know. It's absolutely a miracle. I got a That is an Italian one, you see. <laughs> But uh, I know, I think that the only people that can do without words are people like yourself and Aldous. You know, Aldous began to speak about uh, nonverbal education and yes. he gave it an enormous importance. And uh, it's, uh, it's just like, uh, you know, like a millionaire that can say, well, money is not important because there is so much of it. Mm -hmm. And you can say it and Aldous could say it, but uh, for the rest of us, I think that we have to have the appropriate words. I know how difficult it is for me, you see, because... Uh, words is not uh, my mean of expression, you know, I like other things. And I know that uh, it's very good to have them. And I believe that uh, the, I notice very many young people here, they get so, in so much trouble just because they don't express themselves right. Oh, they say the true. wrong word, yes. you know. They just have never had uh, either the thought or the opportunity, I don't know which, you know, but they they want to say something not very nice, like to say, you know, I would like to go away, I would like not to do this, and they say, drop dead. <laughs> well, people don't like to hear that. <laughs> so, yes, uh, I've been uh, astounded at the inarticulateness inarticulate. of uh, many young people today. And also it goes with a kind of strange, slightly dead-sounding quality of voice, which I can immediately detect on the telephone. Yes, yes. If somebody yes, calls and says, uh, Hello. like um, Mr. Watts, um, uh, I was just wondering if there's any uh, chance of your uh, yes. um, being so that I could uh, come and rap with you. Uh, you know, and oh. there's a sort of dead voice. And, you know, at once I'm inclined to reject such an uh, encounter. Well, those are the people that must see you. <laughs> you must see them. <laughs> that is a very signal. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, you might inspire them to get a little bit more alive. I think there are many people that are not quite alive. Do you find that? Oh, sure. Zombies. Yes, but I mean, also among the people that uh, have taken uh, drugs and so on, that you expect them to be more here and now. And yes, but they, they didn't bring anything to it. You see, that experience with LSD doesn't really do much for anyone who doesn't bring something to it. Uh, but if you bring a lot to it, it, in, it, it enlivens all that you have. The people who have the best LSD experiences are those who say before they take it, 
Oh, but I don't need that kind of thing. What you're telling me about is the state of consciousness I'm in all the time. <laughs> and yes. they, they, have, they have the best results of it. That is very true, but those people sometimes are put in a mental hospital too, you know, because they see too much. Maybe. Yes, you can see too yes. much. Well, the, imp uh, the impression might be so overwhelming. I mean, I'm getting here in your house, here on the boat, I'm almost getting in that place. <laughs> You know, because this water and these hills and the light changing is so beautiful. Do you work here right on this window now? No, I do sometimes. You do sometimes? No, I usually work where the books are. Yes, because here it's very inducing to just... Uh, well, you should with see it. the changing quality of light. Yes. When the dawn hits that mountain, Tamalpais, even those Air Force radar domes oh, get yes. transformed and they look like the domes of a mosque. And I feel I'm in some strange oriental world. And the way the house lights up all these houseboats across here, I mean, the, the sun yes. lights up all these houseboats, they become rich and golden and bejeweled. And people would say, well, this is a dirty old slum. But you should see it at dawn. It's a paradise. Yes. Well, you, you see it. I, and this transformation is really the keynote, isn't it, to our living, to be able to transform... Yes, well, it's that uh, it's sentence nice. which uh, Aldous Huxley uses for the doors of perception from Blake. Oh, yes. If the doors of perception we cle were cleansed, we should see everything as it is, infinite. Infinite, yes. Tell me, um, what was Aldous's attitude in the, the whole process of delight in words? I mean, could you, would you feel while he was working on something that um, he was completely uh, delighted with the whole sort of triumph of being able to get some extremely subtle emotion or some uh, the personal um, attitude in a character that he got just the most used to yes, the right the word most, for Yes, it. yes, oh yes, he was delighted in that way and he was delighted with words of others. You know that he read, uh, he read the poetry aloud. I have a lot of tapes, beautiful tapes, where he read poetry aloud in English and Italian and in French just for the pleasure of hearing these words back again. Yes. Oh, yes, he had the thing of the word. And then uh, when he helped me writing you are not the target, you know, I would read to him. He had such patience. You just have no idea. <laughs> I would read to him these recipes. And uh, uh, once, if he ever changed the paragraph, my editor would reject it somehow. <laughs> the evidence that it was too good, you know, it was a different style. And so that never went to the book. But uh, one word here and one word there, one word there, he would just get that word and or a quotation. The quotation was very extraordinary. Yes, well, he had this enjoyment of word and uh, words. In the same time, he thought that one should uh, let them go. You know, they are not so important. What did he say? Uh, words are good servants, but bad masters. And that mm -hmm. was his attitude. Well, he had an astounding facility in getting uh, the flavor of human character. This is a thing that I admire enormously, because I would never be able to write a good novel. I think people who write novels are absolute geniuses. Uh, he felt himself not to be a very good... Especially novelist. in delineating the characters of women. Oh, yes. Uh, it's so easy to make a rather stereotype yes. of, of women when writing, and it's very bad. I think that's why I liked D.H. Uh, Lawrence so much, I yes. suppose, because he does that so well. But he could get, uh, by a curious turn of phrase, he could get... The sort of feeling about another person where you say, now, I want to tell you what this kind of, what the kind of person this is, but I, I just somehow, they're very distinct, they're a very particular kind of person, and I wish I could give you the flavor, mm -hmm. but I just can't find the word to pin down yes. the kind of individual that is. I like the story in which somebody was saying, um, well, uh, I don't know how to tell you. Uh, what sort of person she is, but she's the sort of person who would say serviette instead of napkin. <laughs> yes. And somebody said, some other lady person, well, I always say serviette <laughs> instead of napkin. And he said, well, you must know just the sort of person I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in the, in the, uh, 
the final stages of his life, he was, uh, he was, wasn't he, about to begin another novel and had written some of it. Yes, he wanted to write a sort of a autobiography, a semi-autobiographical That's novel. That's what I know. gathered, yes, yes, from reading as much of yes. it as you published. And uh, because he felt that there was so much... Uh, Inter, uh, intermingling, you know, intermingling his own life with the events of the century it was so extraordinary uh, what had happened since he was an adolescent or a child that uh, thought it would be a very, well, it would have been a very big work, you know, because that was starting, that novel started in, 19, in 1900, that first chapter that is uh, in my book. Yes. And about himself as a child, I think that he was very much like that child that he describes there. I remember he speaks, uh, also in his lecture, he spoke uh, about uh, Queen Victoria riding on a carriage about two or three miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And now similar ladies of similar dignity and age go around the Cornish or uh, in the highways here at 70 miles an hour. They, <laughs> He used that uh, for, to show how we can really develop our potentialities in so many different ways, in so many different directions. That was one of his uh, constant uh, thoughts, the development of human potentials. Of course, his lifetime spans the most startling change of the speed of human history that has ever existed. And he, he, he simply, his lifetime bridges it. Yes. Because he's exactly. got one foot in the Victorian era right. and one in the 1960s. That's right, that's right. That's what he wanted to do. Yes. yes. And I don't think any, of, uh, any other people at any time have spanned such enormous change. And he was so much uh, with it all the time, all these changes uh, in different fields. Well, the critical period of change, you see, was just before the Second World War. Uh, you see, he before? published, yes, oh, just before right. the Second World War, because, you see, he published Ends and Means uh, just before he left England, didn't he? Uh, that, that book comes about the same time as Eilis in Gaza. And that was when he knew Gerald Hurd first. Now, yes. um, what prompted him to move to the United States? Well, he was traveling, you remember? He was, uh, first of all, he lived in Italy a long time. And then in Italy, the, the fascist uh, regime came about. And uh, Gerald had moved to America. And uh, somehow this whole group of Englishmen moved here. And then uh, he was here, naturally, for his eyesight. It was, he found a teacher that uh, helped him a great deal yes. in overcoming this blindness. Uh, and the climb, and then they went to live in the desert. But um, I think that Gerald Hur was quite, uh, uh, was the, uh, did give the incentive to move here and leave Europe. So it was primarily just his interest in Gerald Hurd and the, and the group around him. Yes, you know, and then if that, what uh, was happening in Italy and in Germany and so on that uh, made him... And in, in England, he couldn't leave because of the climate. He would get the uh, uh, bronchitis just like that. He oh, really? Get, oh, yes. That's interesting. Uh, I couldn't live in England because I couldn't make a living. Well, he lived there, you know, remember when he was a, a, a critic on some newspaper as a young man, but yes. he never really wanted to live there. As soon as he could, he moved into Italy, and then in France, and then here. He always went back. He, he liked to go there for a month or two every year. Well, I do the same thing. But um, the trouble with England is that it pays very little for books and nothing at all for lectures. Yeah. Whereas the United States is quite yes. different. Yes. I remember all this saying to me once, uh, shortly after I came out to the West Coast, which was to have been in about 1952. And uh, he said, um, uh, we were making an appointment. And he said, yes, we're all so busy these days. He said, it's simply appalling. He <laughs> said, because nowadays it costs you. $12,000 a year simply to breathe. <laughs> and if you want to do something more than that, it costs about 18000 <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but, uh, why did he settle on Southern California, do you know? 
Well, I think that the first they went up, uh, he and Maria went up to the desert because Maria had a touch of TB. I think that oh, was they, that thought, that they thought that she might, uh, she might have TB. And then they went up there and they liked the desert and they lived in the desert for several years and then it became too difficult to live there and they came down to Los Angeles. Well, I was expecting in a way your answer to be because... Uh, California is the nearest thing in the United States to the Mediterranean. Well, I, I think California is everything, you know. Yes, I, I know, but if you're, looking, if you're looking for sun and for cypress... And yes, for, oh, um, yes, and the coast particularly. Yes. ...palm trees, and uh, there's a certain... And also, of course, in the Spanish flavor, yes. it still lingers. And then he liked to walk. He took every day long walks. And yes. this wonderful you see, that work. kind of thing has a fascination for some kind of Englishman. There's a saying, you know, that an Englishman Italianate is a devil incarnate. Oh, yes. Yeah. This was originally <laughs> said about um, Frederick Corvo, who wrote uh, Hadrian the Seventh, I remember. And uh, Aldous, having spent many years in Italy, has the same, the uh, same theory, yes. feeling, you see, for that... A magic of the Southland, yes. of the Mediterranean, that I have myself. And uh, so the reason I came here was that I could uh, sort of mix both worlds and have a Mediterranean climate with uh, a standard of living that I couldn't possibly maintain in Italy since, um, well, I don't speak Italian, I could learn, but... Uh, it wouldn't be the sort of place I could no. flourish economically no. without depending on outside yes, things. No, we thought about moving back to Italy, but uh, we we went almost every year. And then uh, the way that we lived here was very, very good because it was very free on top of a hill uh, where there are deers and all kind of natural life. And yet, if you wanted to go to the university or to go to New York, it's so simple and so easy. It's a very convenient place to live from any point of view. Well, uh, again, you know, those Europeans don't pay for lectures. Yes, and again, yes, oh, yes, surely. The economy of an author. Now, it's a very curious thing about Aldous Huxley because when I first knew him, he couldn't lecture for love or money. Well, that's... He used to put his nose in a manuscript and mumble. Goodness, I never... I've never seen him do But this is something you must be responsible for. Because after he married you, he turned into a fantastic lecturer. Fantastic lecture, But I don't know that I was connected in any way with that, but he was a fantastic lecturer. And but it's never... incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. Because what happened was that... Um, right when I first uh, was out in California, let's see, this was in 1951. At that time, Felix Green arranged for him to give a lecture at a high school auditorium in Palo Alto. And he was still in the mumbling stage. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, after Maria's death, he married you. I went down to Santa Barbara, and there was a concert being given in which Stravinsky was interested, of, of um, Gisualdo. Gisualdo's yes, 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 madrigals. That's, that's right. <laughs> and in the intermission, he gave an extremely amusing talk. Yes, and he loved it. I mean, he I really enjoyed doing that. Well, now, what had happened was that always he had been a fantastic conversationalist. Yes. Even though he was apt to sort of take over the conversation, yes. nevertheless, he was invariably fascinating. And he used to fill his conversation with the most amazing anecdotes. Uh, he was particularly fond of kind of horrendous happenings <laughs> and details. You remember that time we were talking about when we had lunch at uh, the Tokyo Skiaki restaurant? Uh, there were four of us sitting at the table, and all the neighboring tables stopped talking. Stop talking, listening, because... And they listened was... in because he was talking about subliminal advertising. Yes, oh, yes. Oh, that really impressed him. How you could uh, look at President Eisenhower, but it really was Marilyn Monroe. Yes, this, this, yes, this, yes so exactly. Was so you also... associated the beautiful girl <laughs> with General Eisenhower, with General Eisenhower <laughs> yes. or with somebody's toothpaste. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, he was going on and enlarging on the horrendous yes. possibilities of this. <laughs> And I remember him once the conversation going on at great length about the appalling nature of fashion in medicine. 
Oh, yes. So that you would never really know, <laughs> know at the present going to time <laughs> whether it was as ephemeral as an operation he once described where they removed the long intestine. The long intestine, yes. <laughs> and he said it, uh, it completely disappeared. That it, nobody ever had such an operation. You see, the only trouble about it was uh, people used to have to go to the bathroom like ever birds. Every 20 minutes. Every 20 yes. minutes. <laughs> Yes. But then, you see, he started to get the idea of lecturing in just exactly the same tone of voice and spirit as he carried on ordinary conversation. It was absolutely like a conversation. I never saw And it. suddenly, he got released from the manuscript. Yes, and, uh, well, he said to me, he said, well, I just decided that uh, what I was saying was really not so important after all, you know. The world uh, it was not going to be changed by my lecturing. And so it, it was, uh, I mean... I'd, I've been with him, you know, before the lecture, and usually before someone goes on the stage, there is all kind of little ritual and things. He never had anything like that. No, all that's a nuisance. Yes, yes. all that's a nuisance. Yes. He just would be at dinner with other people and then walk out on the stage. Yes. He would go sometimes and mumble in somebody's ear, may I go to the dance room before he goes? That was all that he asked. No, well, he, it, it was a very strange transformation, especially for somebody at that time of life. Yes, but he was changing all the time. I mean, after after the fire, you know, we went to live with this friend of ours. When the house was burned down. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we went to live with this friend of ours who has two children and two little children, and it's a completely different uh, ambience, you know, when there are two children. He never he never seemed to mind or to make an effort or to, to, ever, to exercise patience, and one does need patience, you know, for children. But it was a natural thing for him, I guess, or maybe a training thing to take things uh, as they uh, as I came, mm -hmm. moment by moment, without uh, sort of referring to old experiences. I think that, that he had probably more than anyone else this uh, paradox, you see, where he had this terrific amount of information, information and memory. And then he was free, though, of emotional uh, conditioning from the past. How so? Well, because the emotion of the past did not interfere with his present. In other words, he, with his present, he, he responded to the present with a new reaction. I mean, he reacted to, to the present with fresh reaction and not with a conditioned reaction from the past. Do you think he was in some respect helped by that, by the fire? After all, all fire. his past, all the records of his past practically were wiped yes, out. Yes, everything, yes. No, I don't think that the fire did that for him. I think more his meditation and his work with psychedelic mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. his constant vigilance in that sense. He was really very, very aware that that should be stopped, you know, if, that one should stop this uh, reacting to the present in terms of the past. Yes. That was very much in uh, his consciousness all the time. Well, of course, that's central to Krishnamurti's that's whole presentation, right. yes. But that fire... Uh, I, I had a friend who underwent the same sort of experience, right. where she had luckily built herself a new, smaller house, and just after she'd moved into it, she'd kept a lot of records in the old house, and it was burned down. And there were all these souvenirs and letters and photographs and paintings and books, uh, which are suddenly wiped out, and they're ordinarily things you cling on to and you feel you really can't do without that, and then suddenly it all goes. Oh, yes, we had uh, really several tongues of this thing. And so they went. But, uh, he did rescue, didn't he, the manuscript of Ireland? Yes, he rescued Ireland and uh, three best suits, <laughs> the suits that we had made in Italy. <laughs> and three suits? <laughs> yes. Ah. He said, don't you think we should take some suits? I was... <laughs> I was in a completely useless state because the fire had so fascinated me that I was just looking at the fire all the time and I would not even have thought of that. And all of a sudden he said, oh, I must take island. So he went upstairs and took island. And then he said, shouldn't we take some suits? So I said, yes, let's take some But did he sort of risk his life doing this? Going no, back no, no, the... because our uh, our house was not in fire yet, but all around. Oh, I see. The yes. fire was approaching at the yes, time. Yes, it was approach. Oh, yes, I saw yes. it approach. I saw it approach from the garden. In fact, the walls were illuminated so beautifully. You have no idea. It was just the right, uh, the right illumination. Mm, but... Uh, and I was looking so much that I would not even take in the suit, you see. Well, that's <laughs> suddenly not reacting to the present in terms yeah. of the past. No, that's right. <laughs> it was past. <laughs> it 
just, I was just uh, not reacting at all. It was just so beautiful, you know. Yes, it's so fascinating how in moments of crisis, we do tend to become much saner than we are normally. Well, maybe that will say, I don't know. I mean, people have yes. accomplished the most. We, we can become geniuses in crisis. Yes, but I didn't accomplish anything, you see. I just no, looked. well, I know, but you were contemplative instead of uh, an active. Yes, exactly the contrary of my nature. Absolutely yes, the contrary. Yes. I'm very active. And there it was, this fire all around. But who said that the fire... I remember all the saying in this uh, lecture and visionary experience that is it Plotinus that says the fire is the most beautiful thing in the world? Yes. In connection with precious jewels, you know, which contains yes. the fire. Christians uh, still worship fire because for many people the most important time in a church service is watching the final extinction of the candles after the service is over, and they'll all wait on their knees until that's been done. Yes, it's, it's like seeing the sun going down yes, at the moment. Yes, watching the sunset. Yes. Uh, are, are there any um, materials of Aldous left over which will yet see the light of publication? Well, the letters. Oh, that is letters. going to be a marvelous volume, yes. It's coming out next year. <clears throat> it's coming out next year, and there are letters since the age of 14 to the last days, you see. And they are really, it's a marvelous biography. There you see all the, the passage in this man's life. So he wrote a great deal of letters. Was oh, this yes. true all through his life? Was it true after you got married? Oh, yes. He, he wrote, he answered mail once a week, and he wrote an enormous amount of letters. He's doing is, is writing letters, and I always use the telephone. <laughs>